Thank you, Jeff. So welcome everyone. So happy to be here. And I would like to share that AIMS International is a global executive search and leadership development consultancy with a wide local knowledge potentialized with the active presence in more than 50 countries around the world, as Jasper mentioned. We can potentialize your company through our executive search and leadership consulting services. Our passion is reflected in the excellence of our personalized services, our attention to our clients, candidates, and collaborators, as well as the fulfillment of our commitments, always with the objective of establishing a long-term relationship that contributes to the success of each of our clients. So I really would like to definitely hope you enjoy today's session and please feel free to contact us if you need any kind of assistance or support. Thank you, Cecilia, for your kind introduction. And I will now introduce our AIMS International team members and panelists who are subject matter experts in their field. And above all, they are action takers. After our speakers are done, we will have an optional 15 minute Q&A session for those who are interested to interact with our panelists. You can type your questions anonymously through the chat. So our first speaker today is Roger Cater. Roger is the Managing Director of Ames International UK Limited, Life Sciences Global Practice Head and past president of Ames International. Roger held HR senior board member positions in organizations such as Rockwell International, Mittel Corporation and Smith & Nephew PLC. Most recently, he was director of human of Group Human Resources Amersham International PLC prior to the company being acquired by GE Healthcare. Roger has an MSc in Human Resources Management, is a fellow Chartered Institute of Personal and Development, and a member of the Chartered Management Institute and the Institute of Directors. After Roger's presentation, uh, we will invite Bernardo Enchev, our second panelist today. Bernardo is the actual president of Ames International and has a strong background in the industry as a physician, craniofacial surgeon, and as a consultant for healthcare and pharma industries. Bernardo has accumulated experience in biotech, animal health, healthcare services, medical devices, dental segment, and technology applied to life sciences. So thank you, Roger and Bernardo, for joining us today. And now I would like to invite Roger to start his presentation. Thank you very much, Nasser, and good morning, everybody. Before we get into the actual issue of uh, how to create a talent management ecosystem, I'd just like to spend a few minutes setting the scene uh, and share with you from our experiences with our clients in the life sciences sector, what has been occupying them over the last six to 12 to 18 months. Primarily, it's in the area of digitalization. Every business function within life sciences and businesses generally is being reimagined and digitalized and transformed at a pace that we've not previously experienced. And this, of course, is bringing significant change and new challenges into the way that people are treated within the business and the way the businesses are being run. In addition, there is a strong movement within the environmental, social and governance area. Obviously, the threat of climate change has prompted uh, many industri industrialists to reduce their carbon footprint within their businesses and to receive significant attention from board members and shareholders. And we'll be hearing, obviously, a lot more about this as we move on from, from year to year. Artificial intelligence is being used as an expanding range of, with an expanding range of applications from R&D to supply chain and procurement processes and HR. And this is gathering pace, becoming more sophisticated and is being more widely used. Because of the way the life sciences sector is developing, there is more collaboration and partnerships taking place, due primarily to the cost, you know, the 
the cost of actually developing uh, drugs moving forward, this is going to increase. And therefore, the expertise is being drawn from not just one company, but maybe from one, two, or three companies, where who are collaborating or in partnership to develop a drug portfolio. Mergers and acquisitions have been quiet in 2021. There were very few. So this means we think we could see a significant increase in merger and acquisitions activity in 2022. This could be, this could be caused by, by failed or negative results in drug trials, the need to replenish pipelines, and, and the downstream effect of past mega mergers. Obviously, life science organizations need to build trust across their ecosystem. And there is a move within the majority of markets to be more transparent in this respect. Principally, the, the average public are becoming more savvy, asking more questions about the financial buildup of uh, drug, drug, drug production. And uh, more companies are being more open in what they explain and how they divulge this, this information to the general public. For HR people, and the majority of people here, given the subject matter, I guess, are connected or in HR, retention and recruitment, a perennial problem, is continuing within the life sciences sector. Uh, it's facing um, unprecedented challenges in attracting, motivating, and retaining the best and brightest employees. This has been an ongoing problem for some time. It's getting worse, and organizations are actually looking at other life science organizations to pinch people, take people from them. And obviously, we need to look as an, as a, as a, an industry on how we can work with people, work with organizations to prevent a solid pipeline of talent coming through the business. So in short, there's never been a more important time to focus on building a sustainable management ecosystem. In the next few slides, what I'm going to endeavor to do is explain what our experiences have been working within life sciences uh, and companies, how they're putting their own management ecosystems together. In effect, it starts right at the beginning. Uh, obviously, the new people coming in, particularly young bright graduates coming in from uni, it's amazing how many companies weren't explaining what they were doing and how they were doing it in a, in a professional way. So a key item here is to prepare and communicate an effective employee value proposition. You may find the word or the phrase confusing, but in actual fact, employee value propositions are probably one of the key areas on which to focus. And we can, we can share experiences of that with, with, uh, which we've had with, uh, with clients. Building high performance teams who can work in an agile way, given the nature of the way life sciences uh, is developing is key to be agile in the way and, and reflective in terms of the way that they work with other companies in partnerships. Developing new leaders whose job it is to grow more leaders, not more followers. People want to be led, not managed. Building a, trust, a culture of trust and personal accountability is key. And making time to coach, recognize, and develop people is an expectation that the organization, the, the people within the organization are increasingly seeking. Creating virtual teams and hybrid working in terms of flexibility is also important, as is focusing on the results people achieve, not the number of hours necessarily that they work. Supporting colleagues to better integrate work and life. We've been talking about this for a number of years. It's becoming even more important now. Probably focused up, uh, caused by the, the, the uh, COVID epidemic, where more and more people are working from home and therefore spending more time at home. Um, failed to, failure to achieve this, potentially integration, causes people to, to burn out. Employees' rate of learning needs to be greater than the rate of change. And building bridges between strategic and tactical plans show the bigger picture so work has a, a real meaning for employees. 
ensuring people understand why we're in business, what good we do uh, to, for, the, for the local population, and, and bringing that message on, on a world basis within life sciences. So employee value propositions must be reinforced, therefore, at every, le at every level. The heroes in any business are those who serve the clients, not, who, not who, those who hold big roles. So in very simplistic terms, we're moving from people come to work to earn pay, a paycheck to people come to work to contribute to their communities. We, we, we're moving from working from nine till five to working where, where you can, as long as you like, so long as you deliver the results. And we're moving from leadership residing at the top to leadership happening at every level. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Roger. Um, and uh, this was a really very interesting uh, contribution to the topic. Uh, we try at North Lead, member of Ames International, to uh, make our presentations very uh, precise and short. So um, I would like to invite uh, Bernardo and Chef now to contribute to this webinar with his presentation. Please, Bernardo. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Yasser. Um, thank you all to being, um, for being here. Um, before I start to, to say about the, the, you know, how to find, develop uh, the new leadership um, 2022 and beyond, I'd like to tell a little story about, you know, uh, my personal experience. Um, so probably most of you don't know that um, I was, um, you know, I had the opportunity to be a physician for almost 15 years before, and I did um, um, drug research before R&D. I did um, um, training of sales. I was the technical sales guy for some medical uh, complex medical devices. Um, and I did um, a lot of things in parallel with the medical practice at that time. And one thing that I heard from um, all companies in all segments in life sciences. This is hospitals, the healthcare system. This is for pharma companies. This is for medical devices. They always say, well, I would like to have a business leader that is a physician or um, is a nurse uh, or um, a biologist because these people normally have um, they have a lot of uh, technical background, but they don't have the leadership skills for the company. And I always say that uh, uh, this is wrong. I mean, um, when you see doctors, nurses, uh, biologists, and, and, and so forth, and these people, they are um, in, in um, an entrepreneur position or an executive position, they usually perform very well. The problem is, uh, we don't motivate them to go to the leadership roles. We don't connect them uh, with the leadership. Uh, we, we, it's our fault to say, okay, he's a physician, he will do R&D, right? He will do the drug research. He will justify in the molecule level. And, uh, but uh, what if you got that particular person and uh, in early stages in his career and uh, you try to engage him in the leadership, explaining the purpose of the company, et cetera. So I suggested this for a few clients in the past um, um, and, and currently I'm, I'm doing for others. And, and they are having an amazing result, bringing people from the technical level to exclusive um, leadership positions. This is something very um, interesting. Not the guy that is doing half of the time as a, you know, practicing the magical, uh, uh, part and, and part in the leadership. Now I'm talking about exclusive leadership roles. So this is possible as well. But for those technical uh, roles that you want to bring to, to, to the leadership, if you want to develop also new leaders that can really keep up the pace of the changes nowadays, you know, the COVID-19 crisis and everything that is going on in the world today, um, made us know that uh, we need a different approach, right? Um, so as Roger was saying before me, you need a lot of um, digital data driven uh, behaviors. You need, um, uh, you know, this savviness, you need uh, the, uh, 
a fast pace. So for the new leaders, um, and I'm talking about the new generation, it's important to first identify the competences of these people, right? So the first competence that I think it's critical is an adaptive mindset. So somebody that can uh, uh, have the ability to steer the organization through constant change, because you know it's uh, it's uh, COVID nineteen is uh, uh, wars going on, and, and this in our world will, will unfortunately will keep you know happening. So you need this person with this um, blended vision, uh, um, you know, a blend of vision, empathy, creativity, and persistence and resilience. So um, this um, adaptive mindset is something critical. Um, another competence that I think it's really important is a balanced way of working. So, okay, digital is important, data is important, but you cannot rely only on that at, at, uh, at the end of the day, you know, who makes the company uh, uh, results, et cetera, is people, right? So you need a, a, a good combination of hard skills and soft skills. So a good uh, data-driven uh, uh, mindset, but also you know a good articulator that you know can transmit a clear vision and inspire others. Um, then you need, of course, um, Roger reinforced that already uh, the that the data and digital savviness. So the machine learning, uh, AI, um, the digitalization, it's here to stay and it's in a fast pace and it's growing every industry and in life science is not different. So um, uh, this is critical for the life sciences businesses. Um, you're gonna see in the next slide that uh, the healthcare and, and the companies are becoming um, you know, um, more complex systems. Um, so this is totally attached to the next uh, competence that is the, the partnership skills inside and outside the organization. Um, so you need to understand that it is a complex uh, ecosystem. So you have the patients, you have your partners, your vendors, the clinics and hospitals, the healthcare system, the government. So everything is working together and integrated. So you have to understand this complex cycle. Um, uh, the learning agility and agile working is also something very important. We don't, uh, we cannot afford now uh, um, in, in this current days and in the future to have somebody that takes a long time to learn something or teams that are, they, they simply they don't have the speed uh, needed for the business. So you need to learn fast. You need to learn to do quick decisions, you know, um, you, you need to enable your team to work in a fast pace. Next, please. Uh, so those are the competences, right? And um, in my opinion, there's some principles for developing uh, sustainable leaders. So how you develop these people, right? If you're not finding them in the market, but how you can help to develop them. So the first thing is focus on the critical skills. So we talked about critical competencies. So instead of trying to develop the, the whole individual in several different competencies at the same time, no, no, no. focus only on the critical skills. Um, it, it is needed uh, what I call a blended learning journey, right? So um, a mix of one-to-one -one interactions with a coach or a mentor, you know, group sessions in terms of development, digital learning is really important as well, and connect this to practical missions or, or small leadership roles. So when you transform this in a learning journey, blending several types of, let's say, tools or tactics, um, the process is, um, you know, the, at the end of the process, you're going to have better leader. Um, when you're talking about developing programs, um, you should use the science of adult learning and behavioral change, right? So we all know that um, learning and technical competence is usually easier than change of behavior, but um, uh, behavioral change is possible, right? There's um, um, six steps uh, in the behavioral change. I'm not sure if I have time to, to talk about them, but uh, um, it is 
important to use the tools that have, you know, as a background, the science of adult learning uh, and behavioral change. Um, also tying learning objectives and outcomes to your performance evaluation, not just, um, you know, how much sales you did or how much productivity you, you increased, but also if you learn what you had to learn, and uh, uh, this is part of our performance evaluation is important. And uh, the measurement, uh, measure the results after you did a, a whole leadership development plan is also important to see if you're spending, you know, your money in the right um, strategies for that. So overall, uh, I think this is the last slide. Before I finish, I would I like to, um, to give an example about um, what I'm, I'm talking about. And this is, uh, this is not new for me. I'm being advising organizations for many years, you know, to, um, to have technical people in pure leadership roles. But I can give you a, a, an example that uh, has now, I think, uh, close to 10 years. 10 years ago, I was serving uh, one of the biggest um, hospitals uh, and healthcare systems in Latin America, that is the Albert Einstein Hospital in Brazil. At that time, this is 10 years ago, I said to the HR director, uh, look, try to uh, put um, hospital administration um, discipline in the uh, residency program, right? So you can attract, um, you know, residents uh, for pure leadership roles. And also I recommended um, to have a partnership uh, with some business schools and some uh, medical schools, dental schools, nurse schools, saying, uh, so they have the opportunity to demonstrate the possibility of careers in the hospital environment and the healthcare system uh, for those students. What happens uh, 10 years later? So instead of having, um, you know, business people uh, in, in, in this vertical here and a peer that is a technical guy responsible for radiology, um, oncology, et cetera. Now they have almost 30% of the business positions occupied for physician, by physicians and, and nurses and biologists doing this maneuver and it's getting better and better and better. Um, so those are the things that I believe will, um, you know, take the life sciences companies um, beyond for the next um, decade or so. Yes, yeah, so back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Bernardo, and thank you for uh, including uh, some uh, examples uh, from your experience. Uh, that has been very uh, useful. And uh, we have started uh, receiving a few questions, and we, uh, but just before we start uh, the Q&A session, uh, I would like to uh, just remind everyone that you can always uh, register for a free advisory session of 30 minutes following the link through our chat. And one of our team members will get in touch with you to arrange and organize a mutually convenient time. So uh, our first question uh, is from uh, Ken Adams. Um, it says, in such a dynamic era, it is difficult to confuse long-lasting needs with a fab. Do you consider that a sustainable talent management system is something that goes beyond a trend? And why? So uh, I'm uh, uh, inviting um, our panelists to uh, pitch in. And uh, I know some uh, this question, and I can see other questions as well. Uh, they need uh, uh, some time to explain, but. Um, Definitely, your contribution would be very much appreciated. Do you want to take that one, Bernardo? Yep. You and me, or me? You. Okay. Um, uh, that's a good question. Right? I, I think that the um, sustainable talent management system, in order to build this system, is not something that is just a trend, right? And why I think this is the case. Um, well, first, 
uh, you know, the COVID-19 changed the world, right? So you, you, you can access talent all over the world for everything. And also we discovered that many positions can be done remotely most of the time. Um, this just increased the war of talent. If you look at uh, how it's today, and I'm seeing other questions talking about how difficult uh, is the talent shortage nowadays. Um, and, and this is uh, already the answer to, to Ken Adams, to Ken. Um, you have a big shortage of talent. Um, uh, I think the educational system in general is not preparing you know, the new leaders. So there's a, there's a gap on that and the companies need to finish this kind of development. Um, and you only will be able to do that if you uh, implement a sustainable talent management system in your company. So from the base, you develop your own leaders. Um, and, and of course, you're gonna lose some of them to the market. This is part of the game, uh, but you just keep doing it and, and feeding you know, the, the line. By implication, I think Ken was insinuating that this has got a long, is it longer and further into ingrained in the organization rather than just in terms of bringing in new talent. And I, if that is the case, I totally agree. This is not just bringing, keep creating an environment in which you can bring in new talent. It's actually going to the very core of the business, the core of the organization. It's the way you do things around here. And, and that, for some organizations, would mean a significant um, change in the way that they, they actually do things around here. But the bottom line is that the millennials, the, the new guys coming through, the new people coming through, are looking for this type of organization. They're looking for the salary is not just the only issue now. They're looking to share their own personal ethics and values with organizations. And to do that, they want to know what the ethics and values of the organization that they want to considering joining has and what it, what it espouses. So it's absolutely key that everybody is on board from the CEO downwards um, to make sure that everybody is singing off the same hymn sheet. It's, uh, it's absolutely imperative. Otherwise, um, not, not conducting or not following the the. the, the the, the issues that we discussed when the person joined the employee value proposition, you will fail. It has to be uh, understood, shared, agreed with by all within the business, particularly those at a senior level. Thank you so much, uh, Bernardo and Roger. Um, uh, we'll move on to our uh, next question, and it's from John Baxter. I'm in a decision-making position, and uh, I think uh, I'm currently facing significant challenges due to talent shortage for technical profiles. On top of that, the sector is advancing very aggressively now, so the question, how can I generate stability in my team and specifically within my leadership team? Well, I, I can comment on that and, and maybe Roger can um, uh, dive in as well. Um, well, first, yes, um, I, I was talking about technical profiles uh, during my presentation, right? So one of the problems that we have is on the university level, right? So when you look at uh, some of the um, um, life sciences, um, graduation courses, they're they are quite expensive and some of them are very long as well so if, if you look at the last decade or two decades it's it's becoming more and more difficult for an example to um to become a doctor to become a physician um, but this is also valid for um uh, pharmacy pharmacy uh, you know um, dental school you know odontology and so forth um, uh, so the first problem that I think we should, um, you know, try to help as much as possible is to get the talent as, as soon as possible from the university, right? That's, that's one, uh, one uh, maneuver. Once you got them on board, um, I think the new generations, they are very keen to see their progress. They are very ambitious in a way. So to have a very a good retaining system, especially the communication part, right? Where you see these people in the next two years, four years, five years, um, 
deal them with um, good challenges all the time to keep them busy, you know, in the company and seeing the progression and having this personalized uh, um, follow-up with them um, helps to retain these people, right? Now, of course, this does not prevent, if you might um, have a good pipeline that you develop in your company and then somebody takes them away, but this, this is not possible to prevent. But a good retention plan, and, and Roger was talking about retention at some point of his presentation, um, might help you with that. Yes, we, we've worked with a couple of companies where we formed a bridge between the company and the universities that they draw their graduates from. And we've worked closely with the universities to change and to add in the curriculum that they're, 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 they're currently or have been working with for a number of years, to add in the, the areas of activity and focus and, and knowledge that's required by by the client, by the, by the company who's our client. This way, you get tailor, tailor, almost tailor-made um, programs um, for, built, built around the needs of the, uh, the local community and the employees within that community. And that's worked really well. Um, the, the issue relating to uh, whether the person stays when they get to the employer of course, is a, as, as Bernardo was saying, is an issue of how the employer treats the, 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 new, the new person coming in, the new grad. And that's back to my presentation in terms of uh, trying to put into place uh, an employee value proposition, which everybody sticks to and everybody finds acceptable in is, is that the employee type of employee value proposition that the graduate's looking for. Thank you so much, uh, Bernardo and Roger, uh, for replying to uh, this question. And uh, I can see that uh, we are um, about to uh, finalize our webinar uh, due to the uh, time restrictions. However, uh, we might be able to take one more question. Uh, it's going to be the last one. And I do encourage everyone to um, follow the link and register if they would like to uh, have a one on one conversation with one of our team members. So uh, the final question uh, says it's from Peter uh, Wilson. It says this management system seems to be very compatible with new generations. Implementing it for them may be easy, but how challenging is it to implement it in my company where we have mostly employees with an old school mentality? Good, good question. And, and a really common question and set of circumstances. Yeah, where you're in an organization where uh, people have been there for some considerable time and they do things in the old way of doing things, it's a matter of education and trying to persuade them through statistics and data that the cost of them pulling people into a business and then losing them um, is, is high. The cost of labor turnover is very considerable. So I'm afraid in this situation, they will probably understand, given who they are, the, the numbers, the bottom line numbers, because my bet would be that's what they're focusing on within their business, and quite rightly so. How you can put together, if you can put together an argument where those numbers can be improved by reducing, by bringing in new people and reducing the level of turnover, i.e. improving the rate of retention, and demonstrate that statistically, I think would be uh, significant, a significant help in, in your endeavor to, to be able to convince them that to put in a, an employee value proposition which is geared to do that would be very well worthwhile. Uh, Thank you, it, Roger. It, it, uh, Bernardo, would you like to comment? Yeah, it, it, is, a, it is a tough question, right? Because um, um, we all know that um, some organizations have the um, you know, especially in the top management, sometimes they have a lot of old-fashioned people, and um, they have uh, sometimes difficulties to deal with. Uh, you know, the, all, all this data-driven um, digitalization and all those things happening. Um, I I think it's a it's a huge work, uh, but you should try to uh, uh, be sensitive about it, having open conversations, and try to bring new people in. The organization to mix a little bit the leadership explaining why and demonstrating 
you know, as, as Roger said, that, you know, by numbers and results that uh, this fresh blood and ideas is needed, right? Great. So thank you very much, uh, Roger, uh, Bernardo, and uh, I would like to thank uh, all the participants in this uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Cecilia and all the team of uh, Ames International as well as Northy. And uh, I'm looking forward to communicate with all the participants. Uh, we will have our team members communicate with you, and we would be happy to answer your uh, inquiries and questions and be able to um, help you scale up uh, your organizations during these challenging times. Again, thank you so much uh, for attending this webinar, and we're looking forward to our next one. Cecilia, would, would you like to pitch in, please? Yes, because we have another question from Francis Willis. Okay, uh, we'll make uh, time for it for sure. And uh, I'd like to remind everyone that um, the Q&A session is optional. Uh, so um, with pleasure, uh, definitely we can um, attend the question. Um, Cecilia, can you please uh, read the question? Yes, it's uh, what are the benefits and implications of implementing a sustainable management system in these challenging times? Well, the, the benefits are, are many. Um, uh, if you do that, um, I really believe that um, you have a better retention rate, you're gonna have a better leadership and better results in your company, right? So this is the, the benefit side in a nutshell. Um, the implications, um, I, I think the, the biggest implication is you're gonna um, put this system together and um, you cannot rid of it, get rid of it in the future. So you have to feed this uh, system uh, from now on. It's a continuous, it's, it, uh, I think in, in this kind of uh, uh, sustainable uh, system as a, a continuous improvement for your company. So in terms of people, this is a continuous improvement uh, type of system. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and if you do it properly, uh, it takes it takes time and perseverance, but you you are setting your stall out then to be able to attract the best of the best, because this is the type of organisation if the values are there and expands properly and shared and, and actually implemented in practice, then you'll find that you'll be you'll be able to attract um, the best of the best and and once in. Um, hopefully be able to retain them by a, a continuation of the work that you've already started in terms of some of the things that I mentioned earlier in my, in my presentation. It's not an overnight uh, situation to, to do this. It takes time. Sometimes it takes a, over a 12-month you know, period and longer, but it's a matter of keeping on going, putting things into place, and use, use my presentation by all means as a checklist, and then work together. But the employee value proposition, laying out your store of, on, in respect of what type of company you are, what your values are, um, is going to be attractive to, to those young graduates and young people coming in. And hopefully would be beneficial in terms of being able to persuade those people who are in the organization already to see the values that promulgating those values could, uh, could, uh, could provide. So much Bernardo and, and Roger. And let me double check if we don't have any other questions. No. Okay, so uh, uh, we'll wrap up the webinar and I'd like to thank everyone again. We'll uh, be in touch with you for sure uh, through our team. And uh, please, if you need any support in advising and consultancy, over the topic or any other topic in your organization, we would be uh, very happy to be able to support you through our international and local teams. So thank you everyone and have yourself a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you so much.